The erasure of our history through the removal of monuments and the renaming of buildings and the changing of sports teams' names, you've heard all of this. It's, it's kind of almost old news, you're so used to it. But here's a story that's a little bit different, because in this case, the family of the name that was removed from a building is angry, and they want their money back. So let's take a quick look at this. In March 2022, the University of Richmond changed the names of six different campus buildings, all in pretty rapid succession, a year after students and faculty members actually uh, joined together to protest uh, about those names because there were connections to uh, segregation and slavery, of course. So the University of Richmond began referring to its law school, though, as the T.C. Williams School of Law in 1920. And so the, the latest building to be renamed was, in fact, that. It was the T.C. Williams School of Law. And the University of Richmond's Board of Trustees voted to change the name of the T.C. Williams School of Law to the University of Richmond School of Law. And in doing so, the university president wrote this letter, sort of like an apology letter, basically. And it says, quote, we recognize that some may be disappointed or disagree with this decision. We also recognize the role of the Williams family has played here and respect the full and complete history of the institution. No, they don't. They don't respect the history if they're eliminating references to the history. They don't recognize the name of the Williams family if they're removing the name. <laughs> Um, if there's ever been doublespeak, it's right here. I mean, seriously, the very opposite is true. They disrespect the role the Williams family has played. They, they disrespect the, the history by removing it because they can't stand the fact that history exists that they don't agree, to, they don't agree with, that doesn't live up to their standards today. All right. Now, the guy that we're talking about, Thomas C. Williams, he attended the Rich he attended Richmond College from 1846 to 1849, and he was a trustee in the 1880s. He operated tobacco businesses in Richmond uh, and and elsewhere actually. Now, according to the university, Williams's business owned, his business owned 25 to 40 enslaved people. They cite tax records as the proof of this. The family disagrees. Um, I don't know which is true. I don't really care. I don't think that, you know, this, this connection of the family to slavery at one point uh, is actually connected and is reason to just completely abolish the any recognition whatsoever. Uh, bearing in mind that slavery was part of, a life, of the normal life back then, which does not to say that it's a good thing, and that it has it existed throughout human history and still exists today. Uh, in other parts of the world. We limited it here. It still exists in other parts of the world. It still exists in the Middle East. It still exists in Africa. So anyway, T.C. Williams, he served on the board uh, of this university. He was an extremely generous guy. At the time of his death, he was the largest contributor uh, in the history of the university. The donations he gave while he was alive, he gave anonymously. We found out later on that he was this massive donor. But then, after he died, his family gave a large donation to help establish the law school, which was then named after him. His family was easily one of the most philanthropic of the time. Churches and hospitals were built on their donations. You know, uh, so aside from this slavery angle, there's a there's a massive other part of history, including if it's relevant, them hiring white and black people and women, etc., as as fully employed workers. That part of history is known and is, de you know, definitive, but none of that matters to these people. Okay, hold on. So now the family has hired a lawyer, the lawyer who is also a, a descendant. So they, they, pen this, they pen this letter demanding essentially their money back. So it says, I'm just going to be part of it. It's actually a very long letter. It's a good letter. You're welcome to read it. Um, I'm just going to be picky for, for time constraints. It says, quote, If suddenly his name is not good enough for the university, then isn't the proper ethical and indeed virtuous action to return the benefactor's money with interest? At a 6% at a compounded interest over 132 years, T.C. Williams' gift to the law school alone is now valued at over $51 million, and this does not include many other substantial gifts from my family to the university. Moreover, is it not a form of fraud to induce money from a benefactor and then discredit the benefactor after he is long dead?" Unquote. And he then tells them to 
return the money. Now, what I think is interesting about this is that whenever you have an institution that caves to the leftist mob, they do so without fear of reprisal. They do so without any expectation of negative consequence because what's normalized is violence by those on the left, screams of protest by those on the left, harassment by those on the left, and nothing from the right. right? You know, you don't have universities making decisions because the Christians might get angry, or the Catholics might get angry, or the, the right-wingers might get angry. None of this happens. They cancel speakers because leftists might protest. And what I like about this story is that it demonstrates that, you know, that there can be a consequence for not just caving to the mob, right? Because a, a particularly cowardly person, you know, if, you got, if you're the, the, the dean or whatever, if you're making the decision, if you're the board, uh, then makes it on the, on the sort of path of least resistance equation. What's the easiest for me? What gives me the, the least fallout? And so then they have to decide, well, we can take the name down and then all the problems disappear, or we can keep the name up and have the problems continue. And what we need to move in the direction of is that in the very least, the problems don't just go away because you cave to the mob. You have new problems. You have uh, new people who are willing to speak up. So I'm going to continue um, reading this, uh, some of this letter. All right. So it says, quote, since receiving your phone call, was acknowledging uh, what was going on, my brothers and I and our paralegals have been researching the board members and faculty at the University of Richmond. Oh boy, is this fun. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. From what we have heard and have catalogued, the level of hypocrisy of the board's action is truly stunning. So far, we have found an avowed Satanist who posts dead animals on his Instagram account, many virulent racists who publicly announce their racial hatred, faculty members who advocate infanticide, faculty members who favor and advocate for the mutilation of children. There are those who wish to cancel free speech and imprison anyone who veers from a nationwide creed of Marxist dogma. We now also know of students who have damaging long-term medical problems due to the board forcing them to take an experimental vaccine, as well as the board's knowledge of this likely danger. I'm not aware that T.C. Williams drugged people against their will and gave them heart problems. Come to think of it, I'm pretty sure he was against murdering babies and lopping off the sex organs of children. Now, the guy who writes this, um, he makes a, a fabulous point, and what I do like is that he's willing to point out that just the the degree of immorality from modern leftists now, you know, with what they're talking about, with their advocation of, no, advocacy of mutilating the genitals of children. I think we become a little bit numb to just how evil some of these policies are. We're just so used to it. And so his, his presenting the contrast of this supposedly evil man um, versus the people of today who are engaging in modern practices that are absolutely evil is, is it's kind of helpful, I think. Now, he actually states that the, in, in his greater letter, I'm not going to read anymore, that the university itself was built on slavery and thus shouldn't the university close and the people who are working in this institution that was built upon slavery have their names forever tarnished as well. And he's right in his logic, if, if intergenerational guilt is to be applied, uh, then nobody is without stain. And there we lie in a bit of the sort of, I'm not going to say the problem, but it, it's, it's demonstrative of what we're looking at today. You see, with all this attempt to remove monuments, to remove names, to change sports teams, all of this, it kind of reminds me of what they did over in Cambodia with their attempt to bring in communism, the Khmer Rouge, when they started what was known as uh, the Year Zero. Like, we're starting completely over. Blank slate, you know, from the beginning. Well, and if you, if you do that, if you're able to do that, well then, feasibly, you'd be able to better shape the minds of children because they would have no concept to what came before them. And that's the real evil. It's that the, those children would grow up in a world that simply wasn't true. They would grow up in a world with, with no sense of, of, of the debt that they owe to those who came before, of, of what they owe to, to the people of the future. They'd be so disconnected that they're so easily influenced and they don't realize 
that the battles that they fight throughout their own lives in some ways mirror those from before. They don't realize the inheritance that they get as people born in the West. And that's a really dark prospect, but it's also something that has happened before in the cases of communism and in which I think modern communists want to bring about again. If you enjoyed that video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Also share it with your friends. I've got links in the description down below that can help you to support me in different ways. Thank you.